the continuation of the of the series and I guess Amy I guess you started this it's actually Jane Stein started oh did she yeah. okay yeah. great because she did the first one uh -huh. yeah right. yeah well um, uh, I've been asked to do my story but my story is really long so this is a slice of my story today uh, I've already heard people that are disappointed they're not going to get other parts of it, uh, but that's the way it's going to have to be today if we're going to get done with this thing. And uh, the slice of it today that I'm going to focus on is my professional career, uh, which was also about equally interesting to my personal life <laughs> through those years. So uh, it's going to focus, as it says there, on hospital birthing in the United States, 1880 to the present, uh, specifically the neonatal intensive care unit, LDR, the LDRP rooms uh, in obstetrics and how those transitions happened and what my role, my story was within those transitions. So that that is, and uh, I will leave the lights up, this is nap time, so uh, <laughs> feel free if you need to, that's fine, I understand. I'm used to talking to physicians, you don't have to turn your cell phones off, uh, nothing bothers me, uh, don't anybody uh, keel over, you know, that would stop things, but otherwise uh, we just keep rolling and, uh, and we'll get through this in roughly an hour. So uh, let me do a little quick, let me see how, how yeah, this still works nice. Uh, as an introduction, I want to ask who in the room it has, is, or was involved in uh, healthcare? It, we've got quite a few. All right, great. We've got uh, some nurses, some, any doctors here today? No doctor in the house? Okay, try and stay upright but I'd rather have a nurse care for me if I keel over than a doctor. <laughs> we'll say that since it's not here. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, now another question for you. How many in this room have given birth uh, before 1980? <laughs> Anybody in here that's given birth since 1980? Anybody who has been with their their children or grandchildren when they gave birth since 1980. Yeah. A few over here, okay, all right. Well, I think you're gonna kind of feel comfortable with some of this that's uh, coming up and might, might answer a few questions that you've had. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with a disclaimer because I've been blessed personally in the things that I've accomplished in my lifetime and that I'm gonna talk about here today but don't take it as if I did this stuff by myself. Uh, it would be impossible, number one. But number two, I had some of the finest physicians and nurses, caregivers of all types that also helped consult with and guide me through the things that I accomplished in my professional life. And I just want that understood up front. Uh, there's, there's nothing here that I did solo. Um, I had tremendous resources from Abbott and Ross Laboratories, uh, as well as others. I certainly had the support of my wife, Sally. You all probably know her and uh, know that she was uh, able to keep things uh, copacetic at home <laughs> while I flew for more than 5 million miles to different places to work with the hospitals and to do the writings. I've got some books that I've written up here on the table afterwards if you're wanting to look at anything. Um, and I was specifically protected by the Lord who kept exotic diseases, coups, truly evil people, snakes, and many airline mishaps from killing me along the way. So technically, I shouldn't be here today. Uh, but the Lord was watching over me in many, many, many cases. And so I managed my way through that with Sally's support. <coughs> we each have a path in life. The people that live here at Rolling Green Village are spectacular. I love listening to the paths that they've had in life. Uh, and this is just a little bit about mine. Start with the beginning. 
goes way back. <laughs> I was born, this is what I tell my grandchildren when they ask me, how old are you, Papa? And I say, I was born in the first half of the last century in a previous millennium. <laughs> and they have to figure it out. You guys don't have to. I'm going to tell you it was 1946. That was the front edge of the baby boom, as you all know. So that influenced me and it influenced the things that I did in my career. <clears throat> there wasn't any TV, there were no computers, and the band at practice had only one note, so it was easy to, to play things. I grew up in Cleveland and Miami, so uh, two ends, not in the middle now. Uh, my early teenage jobs included sledgehammering concrete reinforced slabs at age 11 for six weeks. I was issued a pair of gloves and a sledgehammer and I pounded on those suckers for six weeks to break them down into small chunks so they could be hauled away. Um, <clears throat> what I didn't know at the time was this is work they normally give to prisoners and <laughs> secondly, I didn't know how strong I was becoming as I was doing this. I just did it every day for whatever, seven or eight hours a day, I pounded on cement. And I went back to school in seventh grade as a kid stronger than most of the teachers. And uh, that was impressive to me and I had no idea it was gonna happen. Uh, third, catching and selling poisonous snakes, mostly water moccasins at age 12. Um, at age 13, I worked for the mafia collecting money. I had some interesting jobs. That, that work I did mostly in the middle of the night from about 2 to 4 a.m. Hot dog vendor at age 14, learned to work with people. I was a lifeguard and a swim club manager from 15 to 19 in my summer times. Uh, and um, uh, my first medical job was as a respiratory therapist, was called oxygen therapy then, at the Cleveland Clinic. And don't ask why they let a 20 year old have that job. So um, that was kind of a collection of a variety of things that I did. Uh, I was raised as a free range child. Uh, <laughs> most of my father's responsibility but uh, that's a quick overview of where I came from. From a medical background, I went on and earned a master's degree from Duke University, Duke Medical Center uh, in 1970 in healthcare administration. And uh, I used that to get a, um, a job at age 24. I was hired by a hospital consulting firm rather than going and administering a hospital. I did a lot of that in the two years that I was at Duke, including being the night administrator at Duke University Medical Center, uh, which led to a number of very interesting situations, one of which was very much like what we had up in uh, Minneapolis that started a whole lot of riots up there where the police shot a black man in the back as he was fleeing through the door of the emergency room. And uh, that, that's another story for another day. <clears throat> but I got to handle sticky situations. Uh, I did the largest strategic plan ever in the United States. It involved 110 hospitals simultaneously in the Dallas-Fort Worth 16 county area. I was 26 when I did that and it was a solo project. So I finished by writing a three volume report and followed it for 20 years. It was a 20 year plan. Followed it for 20 years and they did most everything that I recommended they should be doing. Mergers, acquisitions, uh, bringing together allopaths and osteopaths, uh, merging children's hospitals and so forth. Um, I plan over my career 50% of all not neonatal intensive care units in the United States. So I was very active in that specific area. Uh, and I managed, while I was doing that, uh, I managed offices in Beirut, Lebanon, and Lagos, Nigeria. So I had a Middle East and an African practice, and, um, and that I'll probably come back to in a minute, because it involved, a lot of it involved midwives. Um, I taught at Meharry Medical School, which is the black medical school in Nashville, Tennessee. It's now part of Vanderbilt. 
and I taught a lot of midwives there who, uh, whose practices were in Africa. And then I met with them in Africa to see how their practices were going. So it was an interesting connection. I led the largest facility plan ever. Uh, anybody familiar with the Denver area? And there we go. It was the movement of the University of Colorado Medical Center and Children's Hospital to the Fitzsimmons Army Campus in Aurora. And that campus is 600 acres in size. Uh, it was a $5 billion project. It involved hundreds of buildings. And uh, the University of Colorado moved off the side of the hill onto that campus as it was created in 2007, 2008. Here is that campus. Um, it's huge. It's blocks and blocks of space. Um, and if anybody knows Fitzsimmons or its history, it has quite a history. Uh, President Eisenhower stayed there three times with heart issues. They called it the Western White House for a while. And, um, and it, it was there in World War I. It was there as a um, tuberculosis hospital one of the biggest in the country, uh, but now that's all gone except for we had to keep the old Fitzsimmons Hospital here in the middle. We converted it to, um, uh, to uh, offices for the faculty members and administrators and so forth. And the new University of Colorado Medical Center occupies that, the Children's Hospital here. There's a beautiful VA uh, corner over there on the property. So a lot of really good things happened on that campus, but uh, it was, and I just I say as a disclaimer that uh, the uh, Texas Medical Center in Houston is bigger. And I say this was the biggest. This was the biggest that was done as one project. Texas grew over the years, and it's massive. Uh, but uh, this is pretty big as well. So there I was, you know, pretty young yet, and I got into um, in hospitals specializing in women's and children's health care, which obviously involved birthing and NICUs, uh, tiny babies. And I thought it might be fun to go back and look at what was happening with tiny babies back in the 1880s up to the 1940 mark. Um, as Casey Stingle said, Making predictions is always difficult, particularly when they're about the future. <laughs> Yogi didn't say that, Casey said that. <laughs> well, my job basically as a consultant was to look into the future and prepare hospitals and medical centers for the future that would be in front of them. So I became a pretty good prognosticator. However, there were people in the past who didn't do that job so well. Air travel at high speeds above 20 mile an hour is not possible because passengers will be unable to breathe and <laughs> die of asphyxia. This was uh, Dr. Lardner <clears throat> when he saw trains. <laughs> Good enough for our transatlantic friends, but unworthy of the attention of practical or scientific men. Uh, this was a British Parliament uh, report on Edison's work at the time and we were the transatlantic friends. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Lord Calvin, for heaven's sakes, we know him. Uh, the Calvin system and so forth, president of the Royal Society. Uh, and he wasn't buying it. Guitar groups are on the way out, Mr. Epstein. Decca Records executive Dick Rowe to the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, oh. explaining the label's decision to pass on the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. <laughs> When's the last time Minnie got buddy got a telegram? <laughs> Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? <laughs> Harry Warner, <laughs> the Warner Brothers. You can see it's not easy to predict the future. It's not easy to know what's coming and what's going to be popular. Care of the newborn for the med when medical science stepped in in the late 1800s uh, did a lot of things, most of them wrong. Uh, 
Remember, they killed George Washington. They bled him to death. Uh, we've stopped doing bleedings, basically. Uh, and they killed Meriwether Lewis by treating him with mercury, which made him insane before he died. Um, I love medical caregivers of all types, doctors, nurses, support people. They're trying to cure us of our ills and keep us alive. I have no problem with that. But remember, they are practicing a craft. And it's never settled, as we hear sometimes, and ever changing. So we need to cut them a little slack, a little, not as much as I'm going to show you here. <laughs> The incubator. We all know what the incubator is used for for babies. First warm air incubators were used at the Paris Maternity Hospital in 1880 by Dr. Kanye. They were based on warm chambers for the rearing of poultry devised by the Paris Zoo. So our first human incubators were devised by the zoo and they had used it to, to hatch eggs, basically. <laughs> Uh, and that's where we put the babies. And that's sort of what they look like. Some variation of this sort of canvas covered <laughs> contraption. <coughs> and you might ask yourself, okay, Don, how do we transition from incubators to babies to an amusement park? science or was it a sideshow? Martin Cooney exhibited the Tanier Incubator at the World Exposition in Berlin in 1896. Here's the killer. He, he, they were called child hatcheries, of course. They came from the poultry. Cooney brought six weaklings from the uh, public section of the Berlin's Charity Hospital and he set up an exhibit at the park between the Congo village and the Tyrolean yogurt. <laughs> so how much respect did we have for the newborns, for these tiny babies? Well, there was a reason for that. 90 to 95% of them died. They didn't survive. So they were turning them into amusement park exhibitions. Where's the ethics? I'm not sure. Certainly uh, has nothing to do with real care, but it was a huge success. People came and saw that place a lot. Then Cody immigrated to America. So the amusement park guy came over here in 1903, and of course he settled at Coney Island. And he exhibited these kind of babies for 40 years. So the whole first half of this century basically had neonates, small neonates, being shown at amusement park exhibits in these little incubators. And what did we think was wrong with that? <clears throat> he even put his daughter in one for three months on exhibit. Here's sort of what those look like. Oh, they got celebrity endorsements, too. Can't hurt, can it? Archibald Leach. You all remember Archibald Leach. Who knows who Archibald Leach is? Cary Grant. Cary Grant. Very good. They renamed him in Hollywood. Archibald Leach apparently was not going to be an attractive name. Uh, <laughs> you remember Cary, and he was actually a barker at the, uh, uh, tr uh, trying to attract people to that newborn exhibit on Coney Island. We all have to start somewhere. And out of all of this came a medical universal truism. The two general requirements in the case of premature infants are the maintenance of body heat and proper nourishment. Duh. <laughs> what is it you do with a baby when you take it home? Make sure it's warm and fed, right? What differentiates what you do with any baby or even with another fellow human being? I mean, if that's science, I don't know. <clears throat> Equally important with heat and ventilation, this is the bureaucracy speaking, they got a hold of it. 
is the rigid exclusion of all persons from the room except the nurse in charge. Even the physician does not enter the room but makes his routine inspection of the child held up to the glass door. So immediately in the hospital, they separated all babies from everyone. And then added this from the uh, Children's Hospital in Toronto. If the children sleep interruptedly, they should be spanked and sprinkled with cold water just previous to feeding. I understand what they're trying to do there, but the methodology is probably not the right way to go. <laughs> So this is how things were being done, 1917, early this century. <clears throat> and they concluded in these high-tech issues like incubators that most of us who have had experience with expensive apparatus for warming babies have discontinued its use. <coughs> they gave up on technology real quick. I think incubators should be abandoned entirely. This is first technophobic. <laughs> <laughs> he was a doctor in New York in 1914. He wanted to get rid of those incubators. I don't know what he wanted to go to. I was in Nigeria in their largest birthing hospital, the Island Maternity Hospital in Lagos. They birth over 10,000 babies a year. And, uh, and they had a room with incubators in it. None of them were plugged in. There was no nurse. Nobody was there observing them. They were put there to die. They were neither really warmed, because you didn't have to be warmed in Nigeria, and they weren't fed. It was sad. I mean, I've seen a lot of sad things in my life, but that was very sad. And, uh, you know, Dr. Chapin wanted to abandon the whole concept. 1934, uh, the Chicago Century of Progress Exposition uh, took uh, Cooney's exhibit. It was located on the midway uh, next to Sally Rand. You remember Sally Rand? <laughs> Poop Boopy Doo? Yeah. Is that one of her songs? I remember Meryl Monroe, Monroe doing that one, but I, I wasn't around for Sally Rand. And uh, she was a fan dancer, and they came and arrested her. And when they were arresting her, she complained that those babies had less clothes on than her girls. <laughs> Clutching at things. When Cooney left Chicago, he left his ambulance there. It became the first premature transport device. Um, and then, you know, you had to just say, what the heck is going on here? How, how, you know, are we really thinking about this? Are we really doing the kind of things we should be doing for these babies? And so forth. So I'm going to take a slug of water here. Uh, I mean, it, you know, think back through what we've just reviewed there. And some of the things today that are going on, we say, what? Well, back then they had their share. So let's come up to the mid-century, 1940 through 76 and see how things changed. Finally, some legitimacy. Uh, New York Hospital, Cornell's unit there opened the first premature infant station, they called it, and uh, Cooney closed his sideshow for good. So we've stepped on a little bit, 1940. You see what happens after that. <clears throat> Well, of course, the war ended and the baby factories emerged. They called them that, uh, the boom. And, uh, and it went boom in 1946. And, uh, and that baby boom lasted until 1965. The hospitals were overwhelmed. They couldn't do much in the way of uh, advancing medicine. They were just up to their neck in children and babies. Um, the wards were filled, and these signs went up. You'll, you'll remember these signs. <coughs> you probably went to visit somebody in a maternity ward in a hospital, and on a stanchion in the middle of the corridor was one of these signs, do not disturb babies or with mothers. The signs were about this big, and the nurse in charge 
administrated that with an iron fist. Nobody got on the maternity floor when that sign was out. Not the father, nobody. And she controlled everything that came and went on that floor, including when the babies went to the mothers and when they were brought back to the nursery. I have one of these in a storage unit someplace. <laughs> so at least the, the, the doctor was allowed inside the glass by then. The father was left outside like a prison telephone out there, uh, asking, always asking, which one of those is mine? <laughs> and they'd check the, the, the bracelet on the little kid and try and figure out if that was the right Simmons baby, baby or not because there was very likely going to be more than one with the same last name in the nursery. Those nurseries were jammed, and they used to have accidents where their own baby went home with the wrong parents. <clears throat> Post-World War II, and I have to bring up the government again here, uh, they passed a lot of legislation post-World War II. Uh, most of them were giveaway programs. This one was called the Hill Burton legislation, and it's how the government got its hooks into the finances of hospitals and the bureaucracy and control of how hospitals operated, uh, the regulations. And it was given to mid-sized communities. They would, the government would give up to a third of the cost of a new hospital in a small town that didn't have a hospital. But along with that third of money came a potload of government regulations. And those regulations, which were supposed to be temporary, six to seven years, became in perpetuity by our government. So we still live with the same regulations that were in the Hill-Burton Act from back in the, in the early, late 40s, early 50s. And I fought those regulations for years because a lot of them made no sense at all. I'll give you one example before we get to the delivery rooms. Um, delivery rooms, which were cold environments, the reason they were was because the regulations in Hilburton said they had to meet operating room standards. So all that tile on the wall and so forth, that meant they had to have a 15 per hour turnover of air in that room to keep everybody without infections. Now, imagine you're at the beach. And it's eh, not a nice day at the beach, but you do want to get in the water and you do and you find out, hey, the water feels pretty good. Uh, I don't have that wind blowing on me and so forth. And it's not as chilly as I thought, but then you have to get out of the water and go, how do you feel when you walk out of that water into a chilly breeze at the beach? And what are you screaming for first? <laughs> a towel. <laughs> ah, somebody bring me a towel, this is horrible. Right? Imagine a baby being born out of a warm body and the womb, wet, into a 15 turnover air exchange of a operating room. Can you imagine that's an environment that if they could only talk? <laughs> Bring me a blanket. Why am I here? Uh, I was really comfortable in that womb. It was shocking to the babies. And yet, it was bureaucracy. We had a regulation about that. We don't know why we had that regulation. I tried to find out. Nobody could actually explain it other than it was the same as operating room standards, even though not a lot of surgery was going on in those rooms. And the surgery that was was relatively minor. I know not for the woman, but minor compared to other surgeries. Um, they tied it to the Medicare eventually and Social Security programs. Mm -hmm. and. It went on and on and is still going on. And my job became to question these things, to say, why are we doing these things the way we're doing them? And the answer was always the same, because we always have. Because it's in the, in the book there, the regulation book. Even got that response from the fire department where they wanted to put sprinklers in the neonatal special care units. Now, these are babies with indwelling catheters in them and they're gonna sprinkle the room. I mean, it was totally hazard. And I said, why? He said, because that's the way our code is written. He said, oh, he says, I know what we can do. 
we'll put powder in the sprinkling system. And I said, so the babies that are on respirators who cannot be moved are going to inhale powder from the ceiling? And he was like, yeah. He says, we'll go to the legislator and get them to change the rules. And then I'll work with you. And that's the kind of stonewalls I get with all of this. And there I am, 1970, my first day on the job, I think, I was hired by two uh, very southern gentlemen of slightly older years uh, who saw me on day one with a brand new powder paint. This is darker than it really was. Double-breasted pinstripe suit. I might as well have gone back working for the mafia. <laughs> it, I'm sure it terrorized these two gentlemen. And, and one of them was so polite, so polite about it, they didn't make a big deal. He sidled up next to me and he says, Don, he says, if you're gonna wear that suit, he said, you really ought to take the tag off of it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we were all young once, so we all learned lessons the hard way, right? I started taking pictures as I made the rounds in different hospitals of things. This was a NICU in the 1970s. Took this picture. Who in the medical or anybody knows what this is? Nobody? That's an oxygen outlet from the wall that somebody put a splitter on. You know we use those for electricity at home and so forth. But then somebody else put a splitter on it, and yet somebody else put a splitter on it to the point where the oxygen system just shut down and said, I'm not gonna do this. I got you, you got too much going out, I don't have enough coming in. That's the kind of situation I was running into in the NICUs. The science and the technology was outflanking the facilities very quickly, very quickly. And those became the problems that had to be solved. This is what I'd run into. There's a baby in there somewhere, uh, tubes and bags and you, you name it all around it. Uh, but this is not an environment that it looks like you know what you're doing. It looks like something somebody's inventing in their garage. Or they got real clever and said, well, why don't we drop them from the ceiling? Let's bring it all down from the ceiling, get it out of the way, and it'll clean things up a lot. And you can see what it did. They, they, I didn't call them this, but the staff called them spaghetti factories. <laughs> and here's what they had to do. To reach things, they had to get on a stool that rolled around on wheels until you stepped on it, then it was supposed to stay in one place. And to get up there, had to brace herself on what? A neonatal bassinet, it has a baby in it, and it's on <laughs> wheels. <coughs> That's not a hazard, right? <laughs> that didn't work. That's what they were trying to do. And it was so crowded. There was just no room. The, the Hill-Burton legislation called for 40 square feet per baby. 40 square feet is much. You know, just not much. It was so crowded. So I got together with my staff. This is one of my staff members, Larry Pointer. Larry's a great guy. We are like brothers today. He, at the time I hired him, had the afro. He was a black. Uh, Melody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see he had the light blue pinstripe suit on by the time we got there with the, with the vest. But uh, he had toned down by this point a little bit. He's an elder in his church and a great guy, great family. I say that because I want to talk about integration of hospitals here. And if you see that picture of what's on the wall behind those floor plans, that's Grady Hospital. Floor plans for Grady Hospital. It was designed seven years before it was built. They had to fund it, and it took a long time to fund it. And when they finished the funding, they stayed with the same design they had already paid for when they built Grady Hospital in Atlanta, and it was designed as a totally segregated hospital. It had double of everything. It had 
double operating room suites. It had double delivery room suites, double patient care units. The only thing in the entire building that was shared was the food service, which came up from the basement and went in two different directions. But they built it anyway. In the meantime, we were desegregating schools and, and all kinds of things were going on in our country while this sat on the shelf. When they finished and uh, decided they had the money in hand, they built it anyway. And I was hired to desegregate Grady Hospital mm. physically. Mm. It's the most, um, well, it, it's changed now over the years, but at the time it was the most inefficient hospital you could ever imagine after I <laughs> tried to fix it. I also was involved in desegregating lots of hospitals, one of which required a triple desegregation. Can you imagine what that might be? I'll give you a hint. It was in Lumberton, South Carolina. I mean, North Carolina. Did that help at all? Yep, Native American. What do you think? Native American. Oh, you're being polite. The <laughs> Lumbee Indians <laughs> they speak there now Native Americans, right? The Lumbee Indians had their own wing. The blacks had their wing and the whites had their wing. And we had to bring it together. Um, <clears throat> something else was going on at that time. Uh, I sat in a room with about 12 nursing supervisors around a big boardroom table. And um, about 30 minutes into the meeting, I couldn't even see the person sitting across the table from me. Why? Smoke. Every one of them smoked. It was unbelievable. And, uh, and when I left there, I went and I wrote, I was in charge of the Hospital Administration Currents, which is an eight times a year publication that went out nationally. And I got to pick the topics and the writers and so forth. And I wrote a column in there on smoking in hospitals. And the letter here was signed by Joe Califano. Anybody remember him? Uh, he was the uh, Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare at the time. And he saw it and he wrote to my boss and thanked us for having written that article, which was kind of cool. Joseph Califano. Oops, missed one. So my team went off and we, Wally T. and Frost, an architect and I, uh, created a way to change all of the spaghetti, to get control of all the gases, the oxygen, the suction, the medical air, sometimes nitrous oxide, all of the electro outlets and get them in the places they needed to be. And uh, we created what we called the neonatal service shelf system. And um, we actually patented that. He and I own a, we own a patent on it, never made a nickel on it. Well, a dollar, we got a dollar for it. <laughs> I kept it, I didn't give him half a dollar. <laughs> And uh, this was how we imagined it. And I put it, I wrote about it, I did a book on it. And uh, this is how it came into being. And, um, and you can see it under construction and then you can see one when it's finished. And how different that is than the way they were functioning prior to this. Uh, this today, every NICU in the country has some variation of that shelf in it to help serve the babies and the, and the caregivers. And man, did they need electrical power. <coughs> sick babies are, in my opinion, one of two sickest people in the hospital. The other is a burn patient because their multiple organ systems are giving out. And, um, and no other patients have as much, uh, I mean, I, I'm gonna exclude a, car accident victim that's, you know, torn from top to bottom. But um, mostly uh, the sick babies are in that category. This was a unit in the University of Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital. Paul Perlstein was a NICU director down there. And it was a very modern looking one. He really got into computers and such. And computers were really coming into the caregiving practice as well. Um, 24 hour data Infant, and even controlled the heat on the incubators. And Paul, Paul became a friend. What I didn't know was going to happen was Paul. Um, he also volunteered time at the Cincinnati Zoo to help him with with babies, animals, 
And he sucked me into that, <laughs> played a very bad uh, game on me the first time and had me walk through a door into the face of a bunch of Bengal tigers and scared the willies out of me. I tell you, it was, they had a hoot about it. But uh, I worked with Paul there at the Cincinnati Zoo on a number of projects. In fact, it ended up I ended up working with zoos all over. Worked with Jungle Jack, Han up in, in uh, Columbus mm -hmm. on gorillas and mm -hmm. nurseries for gorillas. I'll just tell you one thing about nurseries for gorillas. Don't plant them with a wall switch where we normally put wall switches. They are very active. They aren't like our babies that we put in the in bassinets. They're up running around and they found that wall switch and thought it was the greatest toy ever. It was on and off and on and off. And the nurses said, you can't live with this. So um, <clears throat> one of my mistakes. <laughs> uh, Jeff Pomerantz, also a friend, I put this in here for the engineers, just for them. You know, the rest of you, you don't have to read it because it has the word basic on it for the language system they were using and the Tandy models 100 and 102. <laughs> okay, I got one engineer who's impressed. <laughs> so this was the new naval service shelf system and it went into it in every NICU in the country eventually and, and really helped clear things up. It was just a better workshop for the nurses and doctors. And that's what my goal was. Give them a workshop that works. But here's what happened to the neonates over that period of time. In 1917, a three pound or less baby had a less than 10% chance of survival. That's why they were using them in the amusement parks and so forth. It was just something to be tossed away. Uh, we weren't going to save it anyway. Uh, and it's sad. By 1970, we spiffed up those NICUs and so forth, and the mortality rate dropped where it was a 50-50 chance they'd survive. And by two, year 2000, it was a 10 to 15% chance they would survive. I mean, they, they would die, not survive. It flipped completely over that period of time. And it did for a combination of things, and I got to play a little role in that as well along the way. Uh, the average length of stay went way up from seven days to 30 because we were saving the babies. But it took a lot longer to get them able to go home. Uh, and I pushed the square footage up from 40 from uh, the, the regulations to 120. They've since gone to 150. Um, I don't disagree with that, but I think it reaches a point where the nurses are too far separated from one another. They just can't assist each other enough. I made a big issue about that. Nobody paid attention. Um, but the support space as well went way up and that, and that was needed. <clears throat> so 76 to present, I'm going to shift to LDR and LDRP rooms here. Good. You know, enough time, I think, to do this. The problem, as I saw it as a puzzle solver in the mid seventies was that the way hospitals functioned for women, and birth was they had multi-bed labor rooms. Uh, they had operating room, we talked about light delivery rooms. They had multi-bed recovery rooms. And that, what I mean here is there was no privacy. Fathers were often not involved, not allowed to come in to any of these places. Uh, and then they went to a postpartum ward, which was mostly semi-private postpartum rooms. Uh, it was a heck of a progress from labor postpartum and, and, and going home. Late of stay was about five days at that point. It had been reduced from seven days when my mother birthed me in 1946. Um, and the nursery supervisor took charge of the baby and dictated when and how long that baby could be with the mother each day. Uh, now, imagine these baby boom women who are now starting to give birth. Remember them? Were they good cooperative citizens? Did they like the government? Did they like what was going on in our country? Or do you remember other things? <laughs> well, the other things took over. And they said that they didn't want to be a part of this institutional birthing. It was an assembly line institutional birth with a sergeant major in the nursery, and they couldn't see their husbands, and 
they just said, we've had it with hospitals, we're going home. So I sat and met with lots of these women. We meet in the evening in some bank's conference room. We sit on the floor in circles with our legs crossed. You can picture it, right? Probably some of you have been there. Some of them were breastfeeding, some had little kids running around. And we talk about what's the problem? How come? And I had women that said, I'll never have another baby if I have to have it in a hospital. And I thought, that's a shame. And uh, uh, so I asked them what the problem, what was the barrier? And the barrier was the institutionalization. They weren't sick. They didn't feel sick, but the hospital treated them like they were sick patients when they were admitted. So I started thinking, well, how do we get a grasp on that? The forces at work were fourfold. There was science who was just you know, growing in leaps and bounds. There was technology, the computers were all coming on board. There was economics, which had an impact on everything and still does. And then finally we had compassion and ethics. And the question was which of these quadrants wins? Who's pushing who? And unfortunately at that point in time, compassion was dropping like a rock. And these other things were taking over and these women said, nope, not on our watch. That's not gonna happen. So they started exploring all kinds of other births. And uh, I said, hmm, what if the hospital, where we all know there's safety backup, what if the hospital could give you most of what you're looking for? Well, that, that was what they call a paradigm flip for the hospital to think that way and to do that. But I said to myself, here I am, just turning 30, <coughs> mid 70s, but I was a part of all the worlds that needed to have input to solve this problem. I was born in that first ripple of the baby boom. I was culturally uh, in sync with the women. I was working with hospitals and trying to improve their workshop for mainstream medicine. I had specialty planning skills in OB and pediatrics, having both invented and patented the neonatal shelf as well as written books on perinatal pediatric care facilities. I had in-depth knowledge of childbirth, both from institutional perspective and midwifery perspective, because I had been working with Meharry and working in Africa with the midwives. I had experience working with all levels of power brokers, both in and out of medicine, so nobody was intimidating me. Um, <clears throat> I'd been mentioned in both the old school, I uh, had been mentored in the old school methods as well as the creative future prognostication. So I understood both of those. I had too much self-confidence. I'll just say that right up front <laughs> for my own good. I, but maybe just enough to tackle a near impossible situation. I had done that in prior successes. Uh, that Texas project, which was enormous, 110 hospitals. Um, the remote international incidences that I had was involved in, the near-death experiences, and some national recognition. And finally, I had a staff of exceptional people with sufficient annual budget to pursue any facility application I wanted to, as long as it had to do with obstetrics and pediatrics. I don't think anybody else had this background in the country. So it was that old question, if not me, then who? So I took off on this idea and we wanted to get from here and from here at the Peso Ward. <laughs> I had to chase a snake out of that uh, ward when I was there, some kind of a viper or no, what was it, I don't know. And uh, it, there's no screens on the windows or anything, so anything can come in and go out as it chooses to. Um, and here's a maternity home picture. This was one of the midwives that I met with in Tennessee, and I went over and visited her in her maternity home. And you can see those windows upstairs on the inside. This is what it looked like. That was her bed for birthing. Um, the windows are wide open. Anything can come in and out. And the sink was a little, uh, it would be a little misguided. There was no hot water in that sink. so. She just had cold running water, but she had running water, which was 
not bad. It took determination. My heart was with the moms. My head understood the barriers uh, that the caregivers, administrators, designer faced and what they would uh, be this paradigm change, flipping everything they do. And uh, physicians and nurses were entrenched in those protocols, the procedures, the beliefs on caregiving and control. Administrators and architects and engineers were enslaved by the regulations and the codes. I had to change a lot of regulations and codes. It was not easy to do. Yet God put a vision in my head and gave me the resources and the context to accomplish it. I just stayed focused on a singular goal of creating a place within the safety of a hospital walls where a birthing woman could experience the greatest miracle of life and not be felt she was a sick patient. The vision, a room comfortable enough for labor, sufficient in size and technology for a safe birth, and home-like enough for a family recovery, private enough for baby and mother to stay together for postpartum care. They called it couplet care. Tom Barton helped a lot. He was the chairman of OBGYN at University of Cincinnati Medical Center, and he arranged, I asked, and he said yes, for me to meet with in one meeting, perinatologists, neonatologists, OBs, peds, anesthesia, nurses from all disciplines, respiratory, even the housekeeper in the lab in this meeting. And I presented the vision or the model, and I had a certain expectation, but I was surprised when they said they wanted their highest risk mothers to be in that room. I thought it was gonna be a low risk kind of situation. And they said, no, they said, no. It's the riskiest time in a mother's birthing experience to be moved from labor when they decide the labor's not working well to a delivery room down a hallway somewhere and assemble the team. Yeah. And they said they want to be able to make that happen right there on that bed. So I went and talked to really expert doctors. <laughs> I had a lot of experts at my disposal and got their opinion on the whole thing. And, uh, went back to work with my drawings and, and came up with a, a situation that I then wrote a book on called Alternatives for Obstetric Design. And in it, I described, this isn't it, but I described what, what I, we call the LDR room, Labor Delivery Recovery Room. And we called it that because to give it any kind of modern title would have turned off the medical exec medical people. We knew that we didn't want to sit, we didn't want to use the word alternative in the title, for example, because we knew that would turn them off. So the embryo of that idea grew and, and some bones got on it because we wrote the book and uh, <laughs> circulated that around. We called it the Combination Labor Delivery Recovery Room. Later, the, the medical people called it the LDR Room. We looked at the function and this book was circulated, um, wrote about it in hospital administration currents, and it had a big mailing list. And I was 33 at the time, by the time we finally got this book out. And my white knight came along, Dr. Richard Schmidt. Because remember, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not even a woman. <laughs> I had three strikes against me going into this. I, I, I kid about that. I used to go to conferences and give speeches to a hundred nurses and they would require, you know, review lists and so forth. And, uh, and 95% of them would think it was fabulous. They loved it. And the other 5% said I was crap and I needed to get out, dragged out by my feet and burned at the stake. It was only because I was a guy and I'm sorry, but they didn't want a guy telling them what a woman should be. And we were, you know, you remember those times. Anyway, Dr. Schmidt, he was past president of ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, which gave him, as they say in Washington, gravitas, and chairman of OBGYN for the Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati. I didn't know him. He called a cold call and he wanted to meet with me and discuss this concept, which he may have heard about from the Cincinnati folks in town or maybe he got a hold of my book, I don't know. 
and uh, he didn't want to build a last traditional OB department in the US. He had a bunch of money and he was about to build one. And uh, I presented the concept to about 30 of his obstetricians. One of them walked out of the meeting and slammed the door so hard the walls shook. I mean, they shook. And I left the room and they voted 30 to zero against the concept. <laughs> this was a tough setback for me. However, Dr. Schmidt, my white knight, he decided to take two of their labor rooms out of service, spend $10,000 and create an LDR room and try it out. So that was the first one that actually came off the pages of a book. His assistant, Rosalind Friedman, and I developed questionnaires to be completed by the MDs and by the families and by the nurses after every birth, and he force-fed that room. So every time it was cleaned up, the next baby that came into the unit, regardless of who the doctor was, had to use that room. And after three months, he called off the study, and he got his people back together. They voted again, and this time they were 30 to zero in favor of it. That's flipping the paradigm. And we published, Rosalind and I published in Modern Healthcare Magazine the results. And in modern terms, the baby was born, <laughs> as our people would say, it went viral. The medical community read all about it, saw what was going on, uh, saw about the success that they had there at Good Samaritan Hospital and uh, they started endorsing it. In fact, that wasn't where the first one was built. The first one was built in Minneapolis because they just took a wing they already had and gutted it and remodeled it with LDR rooms. The P came along when length of stay dropped to the point where they could just stay there for postpartum as well and be discharged straight from that room. So LDR and LDRP, either model works. LDRs work in large birth services uh, teaching centers and so forth. The LDRP works better in the small birth service where they're not, they don't have uh, residents and interns running around and all that. Um, it goes by many names, but I don't care. As long as babies are warm and fed, like they said back in 1917, and they're with mom, uh, I don't care what they call the room. But every obstetric unit in the country now has LDRs or LDRP rooms in their unit, and they compose the bulk of the unit. Um, I've left out a lot of things. Uh, I've left out, there's other ways to give birth. The Le Boyer system, which is a water birth. Uh, I was involved with a number of units, especially out in Denver. They had, uh, they didn't have meetings uh, uh, like prenatal meetings with moms and dads. They had prenatal encounter groups in Denver. <laughs> and they wanted to do water births in the hospital, which is birthing underwater. And uh, I don't have any problem with that. In fact, there's a lot of support for it. Um, <clears throat> but they still need a place. And this is kind of what a typical LDR room would look like if there were a patient in that bed. Uh, with the, the, the high-tech stuff gets rolled out of a room, set up, the birth is complete, they have the light they need, and when the birth is over, all that stuff goes back in a room that is later reprocessed, uh, and it becomes a postpart, a recovery room, and then a postpartum room, and the father is welcome at all times. Um, is not useful at all times. <laughs> I did a study on that. I, <laughs> the, yeah. They, uh, they have what's called doulas. Yeah. Am I saying that right? Doulas. Doulas, doulas. doulas. excuse me, I knew that. Um, that comes from living here and getting old. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, basically they are trained women who help other women during birth. And um, of course we went through the whole stage where the father went to all the classes and everything and learned how to do it and so forth. My study determined that in fact, any woman, even one brought off the sidewalk in the street, was better at helping that mother at birth than the father. <laughs> <laughs> the fathers just don't connect that way. So uh, anyway, there's fads that go through, uh, you know, birthing, as I said, they're not sick patients. 
You do it a lot of different ways. You can do it the back seat of a taxi cab if you have to. But uh, this is the environment that was created to support it. And that's what I'm looking for right there. She's warm, she's fed, she's happy. I did a few other things. I planned the first uh, in vitro fertilization lab in the US uh, with Dr. Georgiana Jones and her husband. She's the hero in that, that pair um, in Norfolk, Virginia. I, you know, I got a little squishy on the ethical side of things uh, with that. Uh, I worked with Dr. Robert Usher at the Royal Vic Hospital in Montreal, uh, where we created the first light spectrum cure for bilirubinemia. Uh, I was trying to build his new neonatal unit. We had no place to put the babies, and he found a sun porch to put them on temporarily. And then we noticed that during the time they were on the sun porch, they weren't getting bilirubin. Um, media. They were not getting jaundiced. And uh, I said, hmm, what's changed here? Nothing except the sun. And so I went to GE at their needle part labs in Cleveland. And I said, all right, we got a medical thing we're trying to achieve here. And we'd like to see a bulb that looks, has a spectrum in it that's much like the sun. It's a natural spectrum. And they created it. And I took it back to Montreal and we installed it and the rate of bilirubinemia dropped like a rock. And, uh, and now there's, you know, that's all they use in nurseries anymore uh, to combat that. Um, and I worked with Dr. Gary Benfield at Akron Children's Hospital to create the first parent overnight room. His problem, Gary was an amazing guy, he just died recently. Uh, he, had, he was an electrical engineer that was also a neonatologist and he had a, a, a doctorate degree in psychology. And uh, he really cared for his families and his patients. And um, his problem was that after they had kept the baby 15 to 30 days in the NICU, and the parents only got to see him through that little glass container and didn't hardly get to touch him and so forth, to announce, all right, the baby's tight, it can go home now, was a real problem for the parents. They were petrified. They would take the baby home, and the first night, they would call and say, we're bringing the baby back to the hospital. This has gone wrong, that's gone wrong. But nothing had gone wrong. They just didn't know how to interpret it. And so I said, well, why, do you have a room near the NICU we could take and, and use? And I said, let's convert it to a hotel room. And let's let the parents take the baby there for the first night. So they're within touch of the neonatal unit. And it gave them the support. They, they didn't need the help. They just were afraid of being so far from the help. And they panicked. And a night or two in that room turned out to be a real financial boost for the hospital because readmitting a patient is very expensive. And uh, now every neonatal unit in the country has a parent overnight room or two near it somewhere and use it that way. And that's thanks to Gary and his uh, implementation. So what's next? I don't know. The boy, A, um, he wrote a book, Birth Without Violence. He's, he also died recently, uh, not recently, but within the last 10 years. Um, underwater births, I don't know. Safety first, no risk births, no such thing. As I see the world screaming for safety everywhere, not just in hospitals, it seems to me that we're becoming far less safe. So we're doing something wrong. And it's not just about babies, it's our whole social structure. And I can't fix that. Um, are we gonna get squeezed out of hospitals for financial reasons? Probably. Uh, are in vitro labs and NICUs, are they going to be limited by cost or ethics? Probably. Sometimes babies are precious, sometimes they're a burden, such as in China, when they put in the one child policy in China because they were a burden to their society. Uh, I think we have to decide 
where that fits. I, we won't go into this. This is uh, Dr. Jones and her IV lab. And then I did go to China and I studied their medicine over in China and I found their ambulance system really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that one. <laughs> Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. For those of you who are already sick of listening to me, you're welcome to leave. I won't take it personally. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed and learned a few things here. It's my story from the perspective of what I did for a living and the kinds of things that I hopefully it was able to impact our healthcare system with. Thank you all for coming. Any questions about anything? If anybody wants to stay and ask. Yes. How did you get paid? <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful question. You don't know how good that question is. How did I get paid? Well, when I worked for 10 years with Abbott and Ross Laboratories, um, I had a very unique job. The Ross Laboratories sold Sinolac infant formula. But they didn't, they sold it to the public. They didn't sell it to the hospitals. They gave it away to the hospitals. They just wanted the contract to, for the hospital to accept it. The hospitals did not sell Sinolac. They gave it away to the patients and hoped that they would go home and then go to the retail store and buy Sinolac. So my department did not get paid for what we did. We went and consulted for free with hospitals uh, in the hopes that they would think Ross Laboratories was a really nice place. It's that simple. Their sales reps were not allowed to be with us when we were on site. Uh, we kept uh, as long an arm of professionalism as we could, um, but we literally, and, and if you look up here, I just brought in two of them. But this is a report on Orlando and East Central Florida's pediatric situation and a recommendation of them to build a pediatric hospital. We did that report for the Pediatric Society in that area, in Orlando area, and from that came the Arnold Palmer Children's Hospital in Orlando. Um, we would do these kinds of studies in depth for free. And um, we hoped that, and they did appreciate Ross Labs for doing that, so they could give away their formula for free. And uh, so the answer to your question is, I got paid out of some kind of money that went around the corner and back into the retail store and back to Ross. Good marketing. It was good marketing. It doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. They discontinued it. Abbott bought Ross. Abbott uh, is not into doing things that don't make an immediate profit. So um, they discontinued the, the program completely. I was gone before they did that. I saw the writing on the wall. <clears throat> I knew that the High Shades fellows were going to be looking for places to make cuts and that that was an obvious one uh, to them. They didn't look underneath that to see the value. But we were, we were very successful and affected so many uh, units across the country, so many hospitals. And uh, I was involved in creating about 10 or 12 children's hospitals as well that didn't exist at all. <clears throat> Another question, yes? Well, John, I've heard that um, our system for having babies and having them viable is way behind many other countries in Europe and... Um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, I've heard that. And then people that say that, they look at numbers, they look at statistics, and they say, well, we don't have as good a rate of this or that or whatever. But their, their societies are not as homogeneous. Or they are much more homogeneous than ours is. So if you go to Sweden, well, they now have a bit of an influx, but, uh, but you go to Sweden, and everybody's Swedish. And everybody conforms to what they're trying to do and their education systems and so forth. You come here to South Carolina and you go from the coastal area to the mountains and you'll see a tremendous difference in education, cleanliness, uh, you name it. And it's unbelievable. And we have to deal with that. And those numbers from the coast where they have bad results because people don't go to the doctor and people don't take their medicine and people don't do a lot of things, 
reflected in the general population. So I don't think it, it's not an easy study to do and declare that. I would say in the world that I've been in and I've been in a lot of countries, now we still have first class people and facilities to take care of things. The things we have to take care of are often much worse. And that's because of the way we live, the roads we drive on, the education system that we have, the, the cultural differences that exist. That, I, so that would be my response to that. Um, it's hard to measure. Some studies are really hard to do. And people that do them usually have an agenda. <laughs> so you gotta watch for that all the time. Anybody else? John, what, about what year was the LBR rooms? Well, it started? was created in my mind in 1976, uh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, it, the first one was built about 1978, and I published a book on it by 1980. Okay. And so it was that period of time that it sort of emerged. But as I said, it didn't go viral until I got published in some national journals, and I started doing speeches on it and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Anybody have a bad question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was blessed in a career that I got to work with really smart people. Um, anybody familiar with the APCAR score? Mm -hmm. You know what it is? Mm -hmm. The test they do on babies. So, it's done on babies. It's done on at two minutes. And, I'm sorry, two minutes and five minutes after a baby is born, they are subjected to the APGAR score. It was created by Virginia APGAR. She was a not an obstetrician. She was an anesthesiologist. Brilliant woman. Broke a lot of glass ceilings on things. She became an anesthesiologist because her professors at Columbia University uh, told her that women in surgery, and she graduated very high in her surgical class, could not have good practices. And anesthesiology as a medical component didn't exist at that time. It was mostly nurse administered, and, um, and it wasn't a professional society as such. She created that, and she created the APGAR score, which is still used today. My grandson, Passed the APGAR testing with flying colors. Uh huh. He was delayed in walking, hmm. and it was 18 months before Children's Hospital. Wow. Well, the pediatrician was at fault. Uh -huh. He was then sent to Children's Hospital, and they immediately diagnosed him. He had had a stroke in utero. Ah, uh -huh. wow! How rare. Yeah, that would be a hard thing to know about a stroke in utero. They call it a form of cerebral palsy. Yeah. He's a um, Paralympic skier today. Oh, oh, wow. But it wasn't detected by the APGAR score no, in that case. Not at all. He is brilliant, but... Uh, well, I knew Virginia APGAR, which was really cool. She was elderly at the time, but she was still bright. I think she lived into her 70s, somewhere in her 70s, but... Um, uh, she was a brilliant person, mm -hmm. and sorry that didn't work out in that case, but it's still being used. Well, it was, it was the pediatrician because there were things that his other grandmother and I had picked up on. Ah, and yeah, was yeah. a young good. couple is afraid to find good. out sometimes what the truth is. Mm -hmm. John, yeah. what, what yeah. is this after school score? What is it? Yeah. It's a very simple, I think it's five points or six points um, that are used to evaluate a baby as soon as it's born. And, and it has to do with things like color, uh, heart rate, and, and, and very basic physical situations. But she developed this recognizing, that's what she did, was obstetrical anesthesiology, and recognizing that children who didn't score high on the APGAR score later develop problems. So it was to get those problems early. And it was done twice, at two minutes after birth and then five minutes after birth, that evaluation. And if the baby passed both of those, it's a pretty good chance the baby was gonna be normal. 
and not have other problems crop up in the nursery. Anybody else? Well, nobody wants to know what I did with the mafia. <laughs> just, that's between you and me, and we won't. We don't need to talk about that. That's part two of your life story. Well, that's part, part two. two. That's right. You need, if you work me in, I'll be glad to do it. I want to hear that too. We'll get to more of the story parts of my weird life. Thank you all. I figured you might still be proud of me.